Hey everyone, Noah Zerby here. This is one of a series of short videos examining questions in foreign policy. In this video, we'll define the concept of foreign policy and we'll explore the idea of the national interest, seeking to understand why the concepts are so difficult to define and operationalize. One of the central problems in international relations and foreign policy is the tendency to speak about states as though they are rational unitary actors. We're used to newspaper headlines proclaiming that the U.S. declares war, or that the Soviet Union tests a nuclear bomb, or that North Korea seizes a U.S. ship, or that Iraq raids an Iranian airbase. Indeed, there are countless similar headlines in news stories every day. But what's wrong with this? This framing of countries as unitary actors pursuing their national interest is built on a number of assumptions that often obscure more than they reveal. While we often ascribe actions to states, in reality states can't act. People act, often in official capacities representing the interests that we define as those belonging to the state. But even this needs to be broken down. Let's start by defining the concept of foreign policy. The concept of foreign policy has been defined in a couple of different ways. In his classic text on the subject, Charles Herman contends that foreign policy has been a neglected concept. That is, a concept that has been poorly defined and treated in a sense like the Supreme Court's definition of pornography. We'll know it when we see it. Herman offers a definition of foreign policy that emphasizes the behavior of states. For him, foreign policy is the described purposeful action that results from the political level decision of an individual or group of individuals, the observable artifact of a political level decision. It is not the decision, but the product of the decision that is foreign policy. In their introduction to world politics, Kinsella, Russet, and Starr offer a different take, emphasizing the policy side of the equation and defining foreign policy as a program that serves as a guide to behavior and intended to realize the goals of an organization, in this case the state. Foreign policy is thus a guide to actions taken beyond the boundaries of the state to further the goals of the state. Finally, Deborah Gerner defines foreign policy as the intentions, statements, and actions of an actor, often but not always a state, directed towards the external world and the response of other actors to these intentions, statements, and actions. In short, at its most basic level, foreign policy centers on how a state works to achieve its objectives and structures its relations with other actors, both states and non-states, in the international system. What precisely those objectives are brings us to the second central concept, that of the national interest. The national interest is often used as a shorthand for the interests of the state. It's what's best for the country and its relations with other states. And in this sense, the national interest is often used to invoke a vision of foreign policy that's rooted in ideas of power, self-interest, and realpolitik, rather than in visions of morality or universalism. It is this usage of the concept of national security, for example, that justifies U.S. intervention in some areas, but not in others. Why, for example, has the U.S. regularly intervened to prevent Iran and North Korea from gaining nuclear weapons, or intervened to force Iraq to withdraw from Kuwait in the early 1990s, but not intervened to address the 1994 Rwandan genocide, or contemporary cases in South Sudan, Burkina Faso, Ethiopia, or the Democratic Republic of the Congo? The answer we usually hear is that one was in the national interest while the other was not in the national interest. Questions of morality are thus pushed aside in favor of material interests and realpolitik. Anthony Lake and Roger Morris, who both served as junior foreign service officers during the Vietnam War era, wrote in an article in Foreign Policy in 1971 attempting to explain how policymakers with real moral sensibilities could engage in the often immoral activities so common during wartime. They wrote that, 
The answer to this question begins with a basic intellectual approach which views foreign policy as a lifeless, bloodless set of abstractions. A liberalism attempting to deal with intensely human problems at home abruptly but naturally shifts to abstract concepts when making decisions about events beyond the water's edge. Nations, interests, influence, prestige are all disembodied and dehumanized terms which easily encourage inattention to the real people whose lives our decisions decisions affect or even end. Interestingly, that quotation is evoked by Samantha Powers, President Obama's ambassador to the United Nations, in her effort to explain the failure of the United States to intervene to to prevent the Rwandan genocide in 1994. We often hear political leaders evoke the idea of the national interest in articulating goals or objectives for foreign policy actions. Indeed, one of the central debates in foreign policy decision-making often centers on whether or not a particular action is in the national interest. Thus, Henry Kissinger, national security advisor during the Vietnam War era, justified the war in part by arguing that it required us to emphasize the national interest rather than abstract moral principles. Similarly, British Foreign Secretary Dominic Raab argued that Britain rightly sees herself as a good global citizen, but she must reconcile ambition with power, ends with means, shedding utopian idealism in favor of a more rugged internationalism, putting the national interest first, not last. And the Indian Prime Minister, Manamar Singh, commented that I have always regarded non-alignment as a statement that India's foreign policy will be guided by what I describe as enlightened national interest. That means we will make judgments on an independent basis, with the sole concern being what what is in enlightened India's national interest. In evoking the term, the national interest, each is attempting to garner popular support for a specific policy decision. If a particular decision is framed in terms of the national interest, it's less likely to be questioned. After all, we have to protect the national interest, and critics of such decisions will similarly invoke the national interest to argue against the same decisions. Perhaps no issue more clearly illustrates the political use of the term national interest as the Keystone XL pipeline project. Initially proposed in 2005, the Keystone XL pipeline was an oil pipeline that would have connected the oil fields of western Canada to processing and port facilities in Texas. The project received approval from the State Department in 2008, which in its review cited national security interests in maintaining a stable oil supply. The decision was criticized by the Environmental Protection Agency in 2009, which asserted that the State Department's environmental review was insufficient and citing concern over expanded greenhouse gas emissions, increased air pollution, pipeline safety, and the construction's impact on the wetland and migratory bird populations. The State Department agreed to undertake a more comprehensive review and issued its renewed findings in August 2011, reiterating its conclusion that the pipeline was still would have a limited environmental impact and was still in the national interest. In January 2012, President Obama rejected the Keystone XL pipeline, asserting that there had not been sufficient assessment of the pipeline's impact. After several revisions to the route, the pipeline project again went through the review process, and in 2015, Obama rejected the proposal for a second time, asserting that the project did not serve the national interest. Republicans in Congress criticized Obama's decision, asserting that the completion of the pipeline would be in the national interest, but Obama refused to budge. And two years later, President Trump signed an executive order greenlighting the project pipeline and framing the completion as a high-priority infrastructure project which would serve the national interest. Over the next few years, the pipeline project was tied up in a series of legal challenges brought primarily by Native American communities whose land the pipeline traversed, and by environmental groups suing to protect endangered species and fragile ecosystems. Then, on January 20th, 2021, his first day in office, President Biden revoked the the permits issued by President Trump allowing construction of the pipeline. In his executive order, Biden, like Obama before him, asserted that the pipeline did not serve the national interest. A few months later, TC Energy, the 
company constructing the pipeline announced it was abandoning the project. From their perspective, the escalating price tag for the pipeline was not warranted in in light of falling global oil prices and the ongoing political and legal battles. But how can both pro-pipeline and anti-pipeline sides claim that they are each acting in pursuit of the national interest? That's precisely the problem with a concept like this. While there are certainly underlying elements and commonsensical definitions, the idea of the national interest itself can be evoked to support just about any policy. Want to take a particular course of action? Frame it as being in the national interest. Oppose the same source of action? Argue that it's not in the national interest. That may be oversimplifying the point just a bit. As we consider in other videos, there are some basic theoretical orientations towards foreign policy, namely realism, liberalism, and constructivism, and each offers a slightly different take on the idea of the national interest. For realists, the pursuit of the national interest is primarily, or perhaps even the only foreign policy objective for the state. Here, the national interest is usually defined in terms of balance of power and the maintenance of domestic security. For liberals, the national interest of the United States largely corresponds with the national interest of other states, and the U.S. has a moral obligation to spread democracy and to protect the vulnerable around the world. And for constructivists, the national interest is an ideational rather than a material concept created through shared understandings. But even if we accept the realist or liberal definition of the national interest, we're still not at the point where the concept is easily operationalized and translated directly into policy. There are at least three challenges remaining. First, there's often a tension between short-term and long-term interests, and actions taken in pursuit of the national interest today may set a strategy for future national security challenges. Consider but one example. In the 1980s, the United States offered extensive funding and armament to support the Mujahideen in Afghanistan. At the time, the Mujahideen were fighting against the Soviet Union, and supporting their struggle was viewed as a central component of the U.S. Cold War strategy of containment and preventing communist expansion. But a decade later, the Mujahideen had transformed themselves into the Taliban, taking control of Afghanistan and offering support for al-Qaeda. Indeed, most of the senior leadership of al-Qaeda, including Osama bin Laden and Ayman al-Zahari, were veterans of American-supported anti-Soviet operations in Afghanistan. The very side the United States supported during the Cold War was now its primary opponent in the global war on terror. Second, defining specific elements of the national interest, that is, defining which policies and priorities advance the national interest and which do not, is often subject to great debate. Foreign policy, like all governmental policies, are subject to intense lobbying efforts, political calculations, bureaucratic infighting, and other forces. Third, states have limited resources, and all actions necessarily involve trade-offs and opportunity costs. Even if we can reach agreement on specific national interests and priorities, and we can resolve the political contests that surround them, pursuing any particular course of action requires the expenditure of limited resources. Thus, the pursuit of one foreign policy goal might make it difficult or even impossible to pursue another. As a result, pursuing the national interest is far more challenging than political leaders and the nightly news might lead us to believe. So that concludes this video. I hope you found it useful. Be sure to check out the other videos in this series, and thanks for watching, everyone. Have a good day. Bye.